Michael, o que, que é esse pau de bandeira por aí? Quer botar a bandeira? Então, aliás, tem uma bandeira do Brasil sim. Ah!
Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paulo Sotero. I am the director of the Brazil Institute here at the Wilson Center. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Brazil Institute, the program on environmental change and security, and also our dear friends from George Mason uh, University that uh, we are all co-sponsors uh, of this uh, series called Managing Our Planet, brought to us more than three years ago by our great friend, uh, Tom Lovejoy, uh, who is a professor at the university, also uh, connected uh, is an advisor, senior advisor to the UN Foundation, and for us Brazilians, obviously, a person very important for all the work he has done for the past, now it can be told, half a century <laughs> in the Amazon. Actually, Tom, we owe to Tom the development of the concept of biodiversity. Uh, yesterday we were together and someone said, oh, he's the father of biodiversity. Said, no, 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 the father of biodiversity is someone else. <laughs> he's the father of the concept. But uh, it is, uh, uh, he's a very influential, has had impact, uh, an enormous impact in Brazil. Actually, he is the most important space in Brazilian weekly press, which is the, an interview in Veja magazine, uh, where I had the honor to start, have started my career many, many years ago, uh, features an interview with uh, Tom Lovejoy, in which he recognizes a great Brazilian, Professor Enea Salati, as the person who first explained what we call in Brazil the rivers in the sky the hydrological uh, system called the Amazon uh, that makes Brazil, as we jokingly say, the only country in the world that makes its own rain, which we owe this to the Amazon, and that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons we have to preserve it. Uh, but this uh, event uh, is very important for us because it goes a little bit off of what we normally do here. We do uh, research, we do discussions uh, on things that are clearly related to public policy. For instance, this coming Friday, we are going to have a s conference, a one-day conference, uh, about the rule of law in Brazil. We are going, as you probably know, through a very challenging period in Brazil. Uh, but we can say on the very positive side that the rule of law is being affirmed in Brazil, and we are going to bring people, deans of law schools, a former, uh, the solicitor general of the country, uh, a former uh, head of the chief justice of the Brazilian Supreme Court and other legal scholars here. This is more of what you no we normally do, but uh, no, from time to time, we like to bring uh, people from the arts to help us reflect and value what we do, I think. We had here, some years back, writers from the Amazon region who are were very well known and celebrated in Brazil. We had also related to sustainability uh, an exhibit in 2008 on pictures of a special edition on the Amazon by a newspaper, O Estado de São Paulo. I was their correspondent here in Washington for many years. And we have, we are very happy to be able to bring uh, today to you uh, Mist of the Earth by Denise Milan, who is a Brazilian, a celebrated Brazilian artist, also an eco activist. Uh, she is a, she works in many different media, but with the idea of uh, focusing on 
uh, the importance of sustainability. Uh, there is uh, if, uh, a little uh, uh, description of Denise's work by an important Brazilian poet, Haroldo de Campos, who said that uh, describe her work as an action of disconnecting structures from their natural scenery by interfering in an extremely creative way in terms of static information. An aspect of nature already splendid in itself is granted a Brazilian endowment to such sensitive art artists. Denise is from Sao Paulo. Uh, she has worked, she has an important project now going in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, she has uh, uh, shown her work in different places, uh, more recently in Chicago. Uh, and we are very pleased to be able to have a few examples of Denise's work in this version of Mist of the Earth. In Portuguese, it's Fumaça da Terra. Uh, it's displayed in the entry hall, the uh, gallery of the Wilson Center downstairs in our fourth floor and fifth floor. Uh, we thought that it would be nice to start this with a seminar. Uh, we talked about this with Tom Lovejoy, obviously with Denise uh, also, uh, and we managed to bring two people that are very important in the, this field of art literature. Uh, one is Manuela Mena, senior curator of the Museo Nacional del Prado in Madrid. Uh, she is the curator of the Goya and the Velázquez and other lesser artists <laughs> of Spain. Uh, and uh, the, that those collections in El Prado. We have also uh, with us Professor Naomi Moniz, Professor Emeritus, Georgetown University, uh, and uh, uh, who knows uh, very well uh, Denise's work, and uh, is one of the persons that recommended it to us. But very special and very important. We, have, we are lucky this time to have with us uh, the new Brazilian ambassador to Washington. And I'm very uh, grateful that Ambassador Luiz Alberto Figueiredo Machado, who uh, was previously the foreign minister of Brazil, uh, to return to the Wilson Center. He was here with us in 2012 when he was uh, leading uh, the organization of the Rio Plus 20 conference. Uh, and uh, we had a seminar here. We were very uh, fortunate to have had uh, Ambassador Figueiredo in that capacity and very thrilled to have him today. I believe this is his first appearance as ambassador in a public event uh, in Washington since he arrived uh, last week. And uh, so I am, uh, we'll, the way we are going to proceed, I will ask the ambassador uh, to open the event for us uh, obviously, sustainability is his issue as a diplomat. Uh, is a very important issue, I believe, in Brazil-U.S. relations. Will become increasingly so. So, uh, I, and after uh, the ambassador, uh, I will invite uh, Denise and uh, Manuela, Naomi, and uh, uh, Tom Lovejoy to come to the. Uh, to, to come to the stage and they will make presentations. But uh, I would like to start then by thank you all for being here and by inviting Ambassador Figueiredo to start us off and thanking him very much for doing this great thing for us, which is to open this event. Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, I, I would like to thank the, the Wilson Center 
and my friend Paulo Sotero, who I know for uh, many years now, and uh, he's, he was extremely generous in introducing me. I thank you. Um, uh, Denise Milan, our artist, but other, but other members of uh, the, the table here, Naomi Moniz, Manuela Mena, my dear friend Tom Lovejoy, whom I have admired for so many years and had the privilege of uh, knowing for some of those many years. Um, I am extremely happy to return to the Wilson Center uh, and uh, speak about a subject uh, using the exhibition of uh, Denise, a subject that is so important to Brazil and so dear to me personally, uh, which is sustainability, which is uh, uh, conservation of nature. Um, and I am uh, extremely glad to be here also in the capacity of the new ambassador of Brazil to the US, and I hope to come back often uh, to the center in that capacity. As you, as you probably know, Brazil has been actively involved in the multilateral debate on sustainable development since its inception uh, from the time of the Stockholm Conference in 72, um, to more recently Rio Plus 20 in 2012, uh, we watched as the concept of sustainable development uh, evolved from a concern of, of a very limited number of persons, environmentalists, uh, those who had uh, carried that, that torch and that flag, uh, to becoming uh, one of the main topics of debate at the global level nowadays. Uh, this very year, 2015, is an, an important year for sustainable development. Next fall, uh, a very intense uh, process of negotiations launched during Rio Plus 20 in 2012 will come to fru fruition when the United Nations adopts its uh, post-2015 development agenda and uh, launches uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Now we, we are going to have a set of goals that not only looks into the question of uh, development and poverty and hunger, but also a set of goals that would look at the same problems with the other perspective of sustainable development. This very uh, concept of sustainable development has uh, been uh, under this process of uh, be becoming uh, each time more uh, perfect uh, over the, the, the years as we sharpened our understanding of the interconnections between uh, its three main pillars, uh, the environmental, the social, and the economic pillars. Uh, artists like Denise Milan uh, have been allies to the cause of sustainable development, helping to propagate uh, its message to larger audiences. Uh, culture, as we all know, permeates every dimension of our r r relation with nature. Cult culture is embedded in our habits as consumers, embedded in our political decision, embedded in economic pla planning. Uh, th therefore, cultural values 
are at the basis of each society's decision to follow or not the path of sustainable development. Art can help promote the cultural values that make sustainable development a reality. Denise Milan's committed and extremely powerful work r reminds us of our <coughs> deep connection with the Earth's basic elements and invites us to look for greater harmony in our in interactions with nature. It is no wonder uh, that Denise's work resonates with people of so many different cultures. After all, we can all re relate as human beings to the feeling of mourning over a paradise that is being lost. The way that Denise represents the devastation of landscapes with the tearing of her pictures reminds us that we are at once witnesses and agents of an unsustainable system that leads to uh, nature's dis destruction. But uh, Denise Milan also brings us a strong message of hope. And I think that uh, Brazil's experience in recent years can reinforce this message of hope. The size of our territory and population and the richness of our natural resources make environmental protection in my country particularly challenging. And yet, with the right policies, we achieved results that are quite re remarkable. For example, just to uh, uh, give some numbers, in the last 10 years, Brazil has decreased I its deforestation rate by, uh, let's say, in, in, in the last 10 years, by 79%. Um, in the same period, uh, 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 green greenhouse gas emissions, uh, speci especially from deforestation, uh, have decreased around 90%. So, uh, this is this is something that we are very proud of, but we we all know that that's something that we have to remain extremely vigilant uh, and uh, extremely uh, careful in terms of maintaining policies that will uh, sustainably uh, pr protect the environment. I will not take more of your time i will i would like to uh, in 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 opening this uh, event i would like to again congratulate denise for her outstanding work and add my voice to hers in spreading the message that other ways of interacting with nature are not only possible but urgent thank you very much The ambassador has actually a meeting right now waiting for him at the State Department. This is the reason why he cannot stay with us for the conference. But thank you, Mr. Ambassador. It was wonderful that we could start this event with this opening uh, from you and uh, hope to see you later today. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite now the members of our panel to come to uh, here to the stage because we will start. Uh, you have, uh, I think, people's. Uh, I, I, I will. Where are Michael? Is there? A, do I have a bio here? Thank you. I'm sorry. I should have brought my copy. But uh, let me. Now, first of all, let me call your attention to the. This is new. Normally, we have 
something with everybody's logos, the George Mason logo, Wilson Center logo, our program's logo. But we decided to develop something new because this series has been very successful. So the Wilson Center design team just produced this logo for the series. And we are now, for now on, going to use that. And uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, so uh, it is going to be in our annual reports. And uh, I, it looks, I like it. Looks very pretty. And uh, I would like also to, uh, you know, present our, our speakers. Uh, I believe that the Denise uh, will come first, will speak first. Is, uh, is that correct? That's what what order? Yes. I think, I, I know that Tom That's would right. like to be the last. The and... Uh, <laughs> You speak yeah, first. she no, she is the artist. We, I I we'll follow orders here. <laughs> no, so uh, no. Let's start with then, uh, Professor Naomi Muniz. Uh, she uh, was uh, in Washington, the director of Portuguese studies at Georgetown University. She obtained a PhD from Harvard University in '79, uh, where she studied. 19th and 20th, uh, 20th century Portuguese uh, and Brazilian literature. Uh, she also studied at Paris at the, I like to say the Pontifical Univers Catholic University of Sao Paulo, just because the current rector or president happens to be my sister. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I was a student there once. Um, but uh, so she was also at Puki. Uh, she's widely published in Portuguese and in English. Uh, her book, uh, The Voyages of Nelida, uh, written in Portuguese, was awarded a best book uh, of 1993 by the, uh, the, the, the Association of Arts Critics from the, 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 the Sao Paulo. Nelida here refers to Nelida Pinon a great, great Brazilian writer, uh, to whom uh, Mario Vargas Llosa dedicated a book, a book. called the A Guerra do Fim do Mundo, which was written at the Wilson Center. A little trivia for you. Uh, or it ended, he ended the, the, the book here uh, for one reason. Uh, he needed to have the full collection of the episode reported in, uh, there was a report, a, a journal of this rebellion that uh, took place in Brazil early last century, uh, the, uh, what we call the, the, the rebellion of Canudos. And uh, he needed to come to Washington to finish writing that book because the Library of Congress had the only complete collection of the journal produced by the rebel. And so uh, thanks to Vargas Llosa, now the Biblioteca Nacional of Brazil also has that because after the news came out, they copied it and sent it to Brazil. But it's, uh, it's we are very fortunate to have Naomi Muniz with us. And with that brief introduction, I would like to invite her to the podium. Thank you very much, Paulo, Wilson Center, and all the audience here. I, the title of my presentation today is An Artist in the Age of Anthropocene, and you understand when you hear Denise's talk. But anyway, Denise certainly disrupts our way of looking at stones as aesthetic and unchanging. And the first time my husband, who is a physicist, heard Denise's ex explanation about the quartz as a metaphor for human survival, he faked a protest. But stones are mineral. Human are carbon-based molecules. And the track is, we recognize Dr. Spock speaking here. <laughs> But in fact, he was very enthusiastic about her concept that artists can make this poetic bridge because indeed quartz silicon chips are present in everything electronic. 
So he suggested that we go to the premiere of the futuristic robotic opera, Death and Powers, by the composer Todd McCover. In it, as Nietzsche had somewhat anticipated in the 19th century, the main character downloads his consciousness in a computer in order to achieve immortality. Now, today I want to share with you two aspects of Denise's work. One, her role as a shaman artist and what that means today. Second, the way her works change traditional concepts of authorship and the artist as a lone genius because for Denise, art is influenced by what Joseph Boyce called social sculpture, and also how science plays a part in her work. So Denise was called a shaman artist by the cacique of the Gavion, Hawk Indian, Amazonian tribe, when she did an installation and art performance with them, celebrating their creation myth as the children of stone. Her understanding of the earth as a living organism and the interpretation of the energy of a geological process that underpins our life on this planet as a metaphor for artwork. It all might sound esoteric and out there, but she asks questions about survivability and sustainability of life in our planet. And that is an urgent message because of the fundamental challenges that we as human race face presently. First, according to scientists, Earth has entered a new geological epoch of our own making on the planet, the Anthropocene, where human species is a potent global biogeophysical force capable of leaving an imprint in the geological record of the planet which is now in the process of the sixth extinction as observed by Elizabeth Colbert in the book of the same name. And one ch whole chapter is dedicated or interviewing Dr. Lovejoy. <laughs> Second, we are at a historical moment of global changes, economical, political, ideological, and spiritual crisis. So what Heidegger had called gestel or in framing, the notion that in our industrial and technological world, entities only exist by regarded as resources or means to an end, seems to have spread all over. The answer to these challenges have been technological, focus on adaptation and geoengineering. Also in the last 30 years, what was a theoretical debate in academia of futuristic concepts now have become commonplace. For example, Cyborg Manifesto, 1985 by Donna Haraway, as a belief that there is no distinction between natural life and artificial man-made machines, or the coming of technological singularity how to Survive Post-Human Era by Vernon Vinge in 1993, a hypothetical moment in time when artificial intelligence and other technologies have become so advanced that humanity undergoes a dramatic and irreversible change. All this strangeness, weirdness, are now becoming normalized or even celebrated by some which in, in turn led to cautionary tales by visionaries like Stephen Hawking, as Elon Musk, about the coming takeover by robots. And you can see in the movies here, right? Ex Machina. <laughs> in contrast, Denise's work raises ethics issues similar to what Pope Francis called human ecology, examining in the summit called Protect the Earth, Dignify Humanity, which was last month. In these times of commodification of the society of spectacle in the hyper-connected world, she exhorts us to stop, look, and learn from nature, the drama of the matter, to be or not to be. Now, the problem of the 21st century is that of coexistence in the heart of the, our humanity. Societies in a globalized world need a language that transcends individuality 
and are above nation, race, ideology, and religion. And that's what Denise is addressing with her language of stones. She's a visionary, in fact, a technological innovator. Ray State, the founder of Digital, said she is an innovator. <laughs> And in the last 30 years, she has been talking to scientists to conceive her artistic metaphor of a language that binds us to our common origins. To achieve this, she has pursued a new kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration, similar to what was proposed decades ago by the artist Joseph Boyce, who said that everybody is an artist and preached collaboration in what he called social sculpture. He didn't say that our people should be creators of traditional artworks, rather that creativity should not be seen as exclusive to artists, but everyone should apply creative thinking in their own area of specialization. Boyce believed that an expanded application of human creativity and a broader definition of art would follow and result in something call he called social sculpture that should be accomplished cooperatively, creatively, and across disciplines. That's now reflected in convergence of disciplines in various fields, activities based on collaboration, outsourcing, interconnectedness, and appropriation. And you know that through search engines, right? It changes the concept of authorship and the 19th century romanticist view of the artist as lone genius, quite the contrary. Today, the artist Olafur Eliasson, considered in Europe the philosopher of spectacle, declares that creativity is interdependence. And this type of collaboration has become a preeminent trend as noted by both Hans Obritz, one of the most influential creators today, and William Derzenvitz in the Atlantic Monthly, recent article, last December, who talks of a new paradigm that's emerging and is in the process of reshaping what artists are. And I quote, how they work, train, trade, collaborate, think of themselves and are thought of, even what art is. This is what Denise has been doing the last three decades of multimedia and performance art. In fact, it's what Jean Gallard, the art critic and curator of the Louvre Museum, wrote trying to place her work, and he made an analogy to biodiversity <laughs> and said that what she practices is art diversity. For example, she had a 25-year-long partnership with engineer artist Ari Perez. Simultaneously, she had collaboration with artists in different genres and disciplines. For her libretto, Opera of the Stones, she worked with six Brazilian composers. She choreographed, she directed with dance theater, a uh, dance director, Lee Breuer, and she has uh, choreographed uh, performance for many public installations. She has consulted experts in anthropology, cultural studies, geologists, geophysicists, cosmologists, physicists, and had a partnership very fruitful with the poet Haroldo de Campos. But the most rewarding commitment for her social practice or social sculpture is her initiative and leadership in the project Espetáculo da Terra, which, n whose na which name is English, is Engaging the Earth Project. She is trying to take to Chicago. And this project has been happening in the last five years in Sao Paulo. It's an art education workshop in six underserved communities in the city of Sao Paulo. It has a four months long art education in the after school program culminating with public performance with 1,200 elementary school children annually, involving teachers, art educators, and community volunteers. For the next edition in November 2015, 2015, the workshop will include the addition of a teenager's 70-member orchestra. They were here at the Kennedy Center about two weeks ago. I think some of you have heard, heard them. And they are, she's going to have also 60 children's choir. 
The mission of the project is the good stewardship of the blue stone, planet Earth, for by the children who will be the guardians in the future generations. For her, they are the symbols of the possibility of transformation and of hope. So, when the Indian chief called Denise a shaman artist, he recognized her role in bringing the ritual, the sacred, the spiritual and healing contemporary world. Jean Galard wrote that her language of stone is about in creating hieroglyphs for our times, and that in doing so, she is rest restoring the meaning of the word itself in Greek, sacred letters. And furthermore, I think she adds to it a contemporary aesthetic of Wunderkammer after the cabinet wonders of the 17th century. There is a desire to order and understand, to dispose natural wonders like found objects cu curated in a manner that combines the sense of excitement of new discoveries, materials, with artistic interpretations of their properties and laws. She is a contemporary soothsayer, a wizard who conjured dreams of what King Lear called the mystery of things. First, by looking at the past of the planet back when it was one mega continent. Second, by her vision at both the atomic and the cosmological level. And that's of an intuitive physicist as observed by Jerome Friedman a mutual friend and admirer of her work. Jerry was an accomplished young artist who gave up his career in art for physics to become one of the three Nobel Prize winners for the discovery of quarks, the most basic building blocks of nature. And I quote him as he told me about her work. Denise Milan's work is fascinating for a number of reasons. First of all, represents the highest level of artistic achievement. Secondly, she incorporates scientific concepts in her representation of the world around us. In her large cosmic spiral installation, Courtyard of the Americas in Chicago, I see a beautiful representation of the Big Bang and the evolution of the universe universe. In my mind, a, sp a spiral evokes an image of an entity continually developing from a point of origin. While the physicist would represent this grand phenomenon using sets of equations, she represents it with artistic metaphors. In this sense, she's thinking like a physicist, but using a different language. She tru truly establishes a bridge between art and science by using scientific concepts as unifying motif for her work. Of course, others could have a different interpretation of this magnificent work, as with any work of art. But I think it's likely that it would evoke a sense of beginning and epochal development on a grand scale. So finally, I would like to make an analogy of Denise's interpretation of the void created, but she calls the drama of the matter, to be or not be, with what Jerry Friedman finds and wonders about matter. And I quote him as he told me, the universe is strange, mysterious, and awesome. What's matter? Quarks and electrons in a 150 pound person weighs three pounds. Quarks and electrons spinning, producing energy that has mass and is contained by the force of gravity. Why are we solid? It's the electrons in our bodies and other solid objects that repel each other. We are all empty space. <laughs> Maybe science cannot explain why things matter, and it's not a pun, <laughs> to us. But an aphorism by Lao Tzu, the Chinese Taoist philosopher, might have an answer. And that's what he says. We shape the clay into a pot, but it's empty emptiness inside that holds whatever we want. 
And yes, Denise, the tectonic plates are moving, but that shouldn't stop us from cultivating beautiful gardens. And I want to be, and with a comic note, because uh, <laughs> we don't want to talk about things, Andy, but I want to mention uh, one of the early scenes in Woody Allen's the movie Annie Hall, if you remember. Little Woody called Alvin the movie sitting in the doctor's office with his mother. What se seems to be the problem? Well, his mother says with frustration, he's depressed, it's something he read. The universe is expanding, Alvin explains morosely. The universe is everything and expanding. Someday it will break apart and that will be the end of everything. He's even stopped doing his homework, his mother continues with a look of total disgust. What's the point, Alvi counters. What has the universe got to do with it, his mother explodes. You are in Brooklyn, Brooklyn is not expanding. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, thank you very much, uh, Naomi, and uh, well, we will continue now uh, with uh, Denise Patel, and please uh, come to the podium and let's continue. I think there will be, Michael will get the movie that you showed. Yeah, the, wait a minute, the, the movie, wait okay. a second, I'll tell you. Okay, um, well, uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you, Paulo, thank you, the Wilson Center, the whole team uh, who really made this day happen, and Naomi, who had the brilliant idea <laughs> of bringing, uh, well, of making us together, bringing us together. And, um, and Manuela, who came from Spain so far, you know, so Tom, too, I'm, I'm very um, happy to be here. So uh, I would like to, to start telling a little bit what my art is about. Um, I, I understand that I'm an interpreter of nature. Then you can ask, but what does an interpreter of nature do? Well, <laughs> I listen to nature. I, uh, I find that there are lessons that we can learn from nature. And um, just going to my, uh, the origins of how this appeared, uh, for 20 first 21 years, I, uh, year, years ago, I was in um, a community of fishermen in Paraty, that stays between uh, the, the city of Sao Paulo and the city of Rio. And uh, I had this opportunity of living with uh, these fishermen and sharing what their vision was of nature. And also, uh, besides the 21 years, I worked for 30 years looking uh, to the stones and really contemplating them to the point that I I could um, see the process and understand the process. So going back to the story of the rainforest and uh, telling a little bit how mist of the earth appears. So 21 years ago, I was there at the, the community and after listening to the narrations, like how the birds, um, the singing of the birds will, will be uh, the time measurements for them how the plants um, will denotate uh, the life and death happening there, how uh, each detail, uh, how they fish only what they are going to, to eat, never more. So how they, and each fish is related to a time, to a cycle. So understanding these little signals, you start to understand how to integrate to nature. It's, and when I was with the fishermen, I was uh, listening to the stories, and this is 2006 when this book appears, mm -hmm. that you will, if you have uh, the chance, you can find it outside. And then um, when I left the place, and I was not anymore uh, in this community, is when the 
imagination of the place came. The, so the stories, they took another possibility. I start to understand what were their myths, what they were really talking about. Uh, so I will uh, uh, show a, a, a movie, lo four minutes only. And it, uh, it's the first uh, entrance of Mist of the Earth in the States when uh, we did a, an exhibition called uh, uh, at the Cultural Center. And um, it was a huge museum, so it was fashioned for that, it was done for that space. And now um, I would like to present it. Huh? Chicago Cultural Center was originally built at the end of the 19th century as Chicago's main library and built in
think so. Uh, now I think we can start uh, talking a little bit about what is this language of stones. Um, Here you have the rainforest and the stones together. They are joining the same space. And uh, if we enter, if we look through a mic uh, an electronic microscope and enter into the stones, what uh, we will see is the, the atomic structure. So this is the quartz. Then you will say, but why quartz? Uh, Quartz is present in 90% of the crust of the earth. It is common. And what is common can unite us. So it's not I speak English, I speak French, I speak Greek. No, I speak the language of the earth. So I would invite you all to come with me inside the cave to better understand how the origins of the language. And here we have uh, oh, we have three formations inside of a geode. Uh, the first one uh, is Pangaea. The second one is Gondwana and Laurasia, when the two mega continents are formed, and then we get to the continents as they are today. So uh, here we have uh, the sealed story of uh, Earth. Earth narrates its own story. So the stone tells us this. It's not we are telling it, it is telling us. So how does this happen? Okay, so let's enter into the volcanic lava, the moment where this is being formed. Imagine we are in 1,700 degrees, really, really warm. And then the magma breathes bubbles of air appear. And the quartz and the basalt will try to enter the bubble. If both enters the bubble, there will be conflict because they have different natures. So what has to happen for the quartz to enter? And this goes to what Naomi just said that I always say is to be or not to be of Hamlet. In this moment, it's the not to be. So how do we get to the to be? Oh, this is the not to be, just forgive me. You know, basalt occupies the whole bubble. The quartz will never form. We will never have precious lives happening. So let's get back again to the bubble. Mm? And the quartz enters this time. And immediately it uh, forms a shelter. With the shelter formed, the basalt that was an invader a minute ago, now it cannot invade the bubble anymore. So it uh, becomes a protector. <laughs> and this is very fantastic. This is the beginning of coexistence. Now, imagine that the whole temperature is going down, 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 and we are getting to 600 degrees cooling. And here the stones are crystallized. Now I'm going to, and this is uh, the geode that is also uh, known as Little Earth. So let's go to the process of creation in Little Earth. And again, little, uh, the process of creation on the stone is it very similar to, the, the, to our lives. It's a metaphor to our lives. So here you have um, different types of formations that come from the drama of matter. What is the drama of matter? Because the basalt and the quartz are fighting inside to, to occupy the bubble. So each formation is a manifestation that comes out of the pressure, the climate, all these, these things happening. And each formation is unique. So like us, we, I have a nose, she has a nose, he has a nose, he has a nose. So each one has a form. And it's very amazing because we think the drama is going to um, 
be an end. It's not an end. It's a part of a process. Going back to the Jyota, and here, the shelter. In the shelter, it has to form very fast. So it doesn't have time to structure. It's what I call chaos. And, but already in chaos, you can see here the pre-order of matter happening. That will take us to the other layer, that is the agata. And in the agata, you have a structure that is not visible, only through microscopes. But it is already happening there. So you go to an invisible structure. Then you go to the other layer and you get to the visible order here. And in the visible order, uh, the structure, you, you, you have done the whole journey from chaos here to order. And then you get sometimes, this is a unique formation, back again to uh, what I call the heart of the crystal. And um, well, here, <laughs> I will dare to do a little step forward and speak about how that can uh, make us think about how, well, how fertilization happens. So here you have the geode all going to the in inner side. And here you had that heart that you just saw going to the outside. So imagine that there uh, is fecundation between both, and we can go to what in biology would be mitosis. So we have uh, one cellular, B cellular, three cellular, and pluricellular. So we go from here to the formation of man. But uh, can we imagine that, uh, imagine that this stone, uh, imagine us human 130 million years ago. Does this change our position, maybe? Because if stone, imagine us 130 million years ago, that means that the position we today occupy thinking that we control nature is an illusion. In reality, we are part of nature. So it's another way of looking. Maybe through this other way of looking, we can better understand how structures evolve, look to structures that survive, learn through structures that survive. Maybe our, our species today are not working with structures that are surviving. And maybe uh, there these lessons can protect our species to, to endure in life. And now I'm uh, making just a final point between those structures and the exhibition and the exhibition that is in the fourth, fifth, and ground floor. So in paradise here, oh my god, in paradise here that is the first part, is like when the basalt and the quartz are coming together. Uh, the uh, nature is in its potential moment, and there is not the knowledge of structure, so it can be fragile. In Paradise Lost is when we ignore the structures. The structures are ignored. So the basalt invades the bubble. What happens? The precious lives becomes far away. We lose it. And uh, on the paradise we regained is when the structures that we just spoke about, they are understood. And uh, we can bring them uh, to our life. So we are speaking about coexistence, and we are speaking about survival. So here it is. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, well, we are going to hear now uh, from uh, Manuela Mena, that I uh, told you 
He is the curator of 18th century painting and Goya at the Prado in Madrid. Uh, she holds a PhD from the Complutense University uh, in Madrid, specializing in the field of drawing and 17th century Italian painting. Uh, from 71 to 81, she taught in the Autonomous University of Madrid. Uh, at the Prado, uh, she was deputy director of conservation and research uh, and a member of its board also. Uh, there she uh, organized numerous numerous exhibitions such as Murillo in 82 in collaboration with the Royal Academy in London. She participated in the organization of exhibitions Goya and the Spirit of the Enlightenment uh, in collaboration with the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the Metropolitan Museum of New York. Among uh, more recent exhibitions, she has curated at the Manet at the, uh, the, Manet at the Prado, Goya in Times of War, Francis Bacon, and the Enclosed Beauty. So, and I am uh, very, very curious to learn what a curator of that type of art will tell us about this type of art. I'm very curious about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Honora. You have a PowerPoint, right? Yes, it works. It's already there. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for the introduc introduction of the director of the Brazilian Center um, and his thoughts about me and my presence here, which are always beautiful and I'm very Cartesian in a way and I'm always doubting what I do or what I say. <laughs> and what are the results, and I think that's the only way to proceed in life. Um, I have to say that uh, I have a distant relation <coughs> to President Wilson, and that was because I studied in the United States, in Boston, and I was in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts under the direction of Miss Eleanor Serre. She wanted to be called like that, and Miss Eleanor Serre, who was a brilliant curator of prints and drawings in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, one of the first cura women curators in this country, was the granddaughter of President Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was with her for two years and, and more uh, after she died. Uh, she was coming to Madrid and I was coming to America and we had an incredible relation. And I, and I just came to know through her who had really been President Wilson. Uh, so I always had an interest um, on this president, and this center for me is interesting. Interesting because I think that President Wilson, if he was alive now, if he was the president now, he would be incredibly concerned about the issues that we are all concerned in this life, in this moment, uh, the present men and women, climate change, destruction of vast areas of the world, the irreversible loss of natural habitats and wilderness. Uh, he did the United Nations, and with success, I think, with up and downs and with the difficulties of many crossed interests, but I think he will also succeed in, trying in, in making us to find a way, a path in life, to find a solution to all these problems. I like Denise very much, and I am here because of that. Not because I love her, if she's a friend, but because I met her a long time ago. It must be now about 40 years that we met, when we were both very young. She's younger than me. And she was already a very curious personality that I could see. 
I was already an art historian or decided in myself to be an art historian and she was not. <laughs> she was not an artist, clearly. But um, the curiosity of Denise and the many interests that she had uh, made her a very interesting person that developed instantly after her stay in Spain and coming back to Brazil in, in what she is now. She is an artist, or Denise does her best to draw attention to the big problems of her country in the rainforests, near sa the, the ones that she had told about, near Paraty and Rio, in between um, Sao Paulo, Paraty and Rio de Janeiro and the Amazon. She is a political artist. I think that somebody has said here before, I don't know if, if it was Denise herself, or Naomi, that an artist is not political or has not been political until recently. But I, I just doubt about that. I think artists are the most political human beings on earth from the beginning. And first of all, they are always quite close to power and that make an artist political because they see through the power in a very special way. I am in charge of Goya for a few years. I have been 20 years now in charge of Goya at the Prado Museum. And he is the paradigm of a political artist. He's studying, and we were discussing that, Denise, yesterday, Denise and myself. Was he a political artist? Yeah, he was. He was, in, in, in he was on the side of, um, at that time, um, liberal ideas or revolutionary ideas. He was on that side. He was also an artist deeply interested in the human beings and their actions. He was interested in power and in poverty, in good and evil, in everything. So I think that is a political artist. And Denise certainly is a political artist in the sense of discovering to other people what is happening in front of us. It is very difficult to be aware of our world, I think. Um, we have here, uh, in, in this presentation that I brought today, there are photographs that I took when I was there in, in that region for the first and the last time in my life in the year 2000, so 15 years ago. And I took these photographs in a way that um, was very similar to my how to say in English, the people of my own country in the past, in the 15th century, that were the first Europeans to arrive to America. So I feel a descendant of those people. The Portuguese came a bit later, not too much, but later. We were the first <laughs> <laughs> in discovering the unknown or discovery of encountering, as it is said now, the unknown uh, continent, a continent without name. And this is the way they saw it. We have letters and um, documentation of the ones that arrived there, including, including Christopher Columbus, of the incredible sense of astonishment of this new world, of the variety of the flowers that they saw, of the animals that they encountered, completely new. It might have been something much more incredible than when man arrived to the moon, where we had already lost our virginity, which I think it was lost in terms of the European countries uh, arriving to the, to, the, to the American continent. So this is what I saw, this incredible range of mountains, this sea which was so extensive as I never seen before. This rain that arrived like uh, every day at a certain time, it was really unbelievable. Um, this is the site of near, near Paraty. I don't know how to do it, so don't. I have it here somewhere. Yeah. This is also part of that. I will go quicker or faster. There are photographs taken by me and photographs of uh, Denise project. Um, and you will see the quality is quite different in my photographs and her photographs. But in any case, I haven't changed. I didn't have a digital camera then, and I haven't changed or trying to improve what I did. 
because I think that I also wanted to give you this sense of loss because I'm sure that what I saw 15 years ago is not there any longer. I'm absolutely sure. I don't know if Denise could have uh, tell, me, tell, tell us that or not, but I am sure that the whole thing is a game change for the worst. You are confronted to this, this incredible mass of green, which is unbelievable. It is exceptional. It's something that you had never seen. And I saw it with my eyes, but also with the eyes of history, in the sense that I was always feeling how our European of that time were confronted to this new world, completely different and so rich in the greens and in the water that it was inimaginable. inimaginable. Here you have a photograph of Denise, but I took many in the Amazon of these incredible reflections that you don't know where is the water, which is unreal because it's a reflection, and where is the reality of the trees on top of that? You know, sometimes the stillness of the forest is so incredible that the water doesn't move and you feel that you don't know where you are. You are between the reality and the non-reality in an incredible way. And then there is the mist, the fumasa, as they say in Portuguese, fumarada in Spanish, that goes every morning from the air to the sky and then falls as the rain and then up again. And here you have another photograph of this incredible pass, immaterial pass of the forest. I told you that it's a still forest. The, 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 the forest is still, untouched, unmoved. And suddenly, for some incredible miracle, a leaf, only one leaf moves for you know, a minute and then stops. I still would like to know why that happens. There is another photograph with the same island that you will see here many times and is uh, the center of Denise's um, art around these, these facts. And this is a beautiful photograph. You have seen, you can see also the ideas of the contrast of the light and dark and how the trees are different, um, how you see this purity of the leaves against the white or the blue of the sky. And I'm sure that when our antenati, if I can remember the word in English, the people behind us, ancestors. with our ancestors, arrived there, the artists of the time coming from Europe, from a dull Europe, uh, at the eyes of, of this new world, they were, I'm sure, completely taken by that and it's reflected in the art of South America, of Brazil. This photograph I took, the one on the right, in Rio de Janeiro, in one of the convents of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And you can see how this incredible variety of the iron, <coughs> the work of the iron, almost reflects the idea of the forest, of the rainforest. Here there are three photographs, which I think are mine in this case, where I saw different aspects of the forest which were for me incredibly different from what I have seen beforehand. The paths that interfere, the roots that come out of the earth and are like different paths, and the green of the leaves. We have in the Prado now, in these days, a piece which is not from Brazil, it's from Colombia, but it's the same in a way. This is a custody called La Lechuga, the lettuce, then they call it, and is a great masterpiece of the 17th century, early 17th century by an European artist, Spanish, that went to Colombia. It's all in green um, es es enamel with emeralds. And I think that never, never in Europe they could have had the idea of doing this. This is only the reflection of the forest so clearly that when I see my colleagues talking about the Renaissance, the Baroque, the gold, and never talking about the green enamel and the emeralds in this way, I'm astonished. I don't know what they're talking about because look at this. I mean, when you see this in emeralds and enamels, is the real forest. And the richness of the forest 
as you can see here, you know, in the land of Paraty, this, I think, is taken by me, amazed by the incredible amount of little leaves. It's exactly the interior of these uh, buildings, this one in Rio de Janeiro, the convent of Santo Antonio or San Francisco, uh, which is full, completely full of things like the forest in a certain order, which is organic and natural. You see, for example, this decoration of the trees with the bromelias. I'm not a scientist, not a biologist, not uh, um, um, in, in, in plants and things, but these uh, things that hang from the trees adding to the actual tree a new decoration and, a new and holding the water of the forest are very similar to the ones, lamp holders that you find in the churches in, in that area. It is a paradise. It is the concept, archetypical, archetyp archetypical, well, archetypal concept of paradise that we all have in our minds from we don't know where. But it's the idea of man living in nature completely in accordance to it. And there is a photograph here taken by me that in there that you see these two people, a young, youngish man, a boy, and a little girl, almost naked, in the water, you know, mm. in a perfect accordance to the nature which is around them. It is exactly the idea of Bosch in the paradise, in the wing of the paradise, in the garden of earthly delights. Is the perfect, the perfect humanity in a perfect world. You have all the photographs of this area, with these masses of rocks, which have certain shapes that also are unseen in our countries. And that one, for example, which comes from the book of Denise, you can see the rock covered with a green and in an, in, an incredible kind of monster coming out of that. And again, I'm using Bosch. So you see, when he represents the paradise in the in this on the side in which is already getting towards the center of the triptych with the earth, that there is also a kind of monster in the same way. There is also in this paradise which is lost um, the exuberance, which I think I also told you, the is the exuberance in all the three kingdoms of nature in the vegetation, which is incredible. In the vegetation here, you have this constant change between the living things and the dying ones without, without a stop. In the animals, like the fish going around, those fish that Denise said, that the Kaisara Indians never got more than they needed. But if you look, even at this table, I'm not talking about fish, I'm talking about water, which is going to be very scarce in the future. And look at our glasses. They're completely full. I drank only one centimeter. Another one drank a little bit more. But the water will stay here. Too much water. We don't need that much water. And it was ice, which we also uh, consume energy in making the ice somewhere here in the building. Uh, electricity and fuel and whatever, you know. We don't need it. We don't need that much. But it is there. They also got what were they going to eat, what the family was going to eat. Well, these incredible animals that, this is a photograph of Denise, but we saw it. The animal, this bull that had three horns, four eyes, a double sex, and it was alive and happy in the fields, moving around, completely nature, completely perfect. But not only the animals, irrational, as they are called, but also the rational animals had this incredible exuberance. That lady in the center had these 20 sons and daughters herself, you know? Is a, is a, is she was a Kaisara Indian. Uh, Denise is uses, and she has seen it, so I will pass quickly, um, this, this mixture in her art, this mixture of uh, the the, the different worlds, the different kingdoms. 
um, the flowers, the plants, the remembrance of the animals sometimes, and also the stones, the crystals in there, you know, like that one or this one. Unfortunately, uh, this paradise, or yeah, this paradise was not an Ortus Conclusus, you know, the idea of the 15th century or the med medieval ages, the Ortus Conclusus is a perfect place, a perfect garden surrounded by a wall where lovers are, for example, or the virgin and child, completely apart from everything else and forever like that, maintained forever in that perfection. But Earth and the Amazon and the rainy forest is not an ortus conclusus. It is a garden where everybody comes in and out. And you can see photographs of the deforestation of the rainforests. Deforestation that with our Western sense of water organized in these magazines, the wood here is the wood of Ikea, the magazine where they, 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 they storage the wood, some of it, a lot of it from the Amazon, or you know, these very organized machines walking, moving around in perfect order, like an army, is the soya, the soya plantations, which is one of the dangers of the Amazon. I think it's a very beautiful photograph, isn't it? And this is the Nisus. This is the golden road. Is it, all, it is almost like the Roman uh, roads in Europe going through the empire. This was the road, so this is part of a road built by the, mm, I wouldn't say conquerors, but you know, the first people arriving there, the Europeans in the 16th century, and is the path of the gold, where they used to move the gold from one place to the other. And the Nisus uses the idea of the gold in order to represent the destruction of, the, of this forest. Uh, and later on we will see it. From this path, which is integrated in the forest, if you see it with a beautiful stone, I've hardly m touched or cut, you know, in the forest, taking the movement of the forest, we go to this very beautiful highway that uh, goes all the way from Sao Paulo to uh, Rio de Janeiro. It's fantastic. It's a construction that has united things that never before were united. It's the progress. It's the new civilization going through the Ortus Conclusus concept. You have here, taken from internet, the Brazilian highway system is the highway system of Brazil, as, a, uh, as it was in 2010, the system consists of almost 2 million kilometers of roads, of which approximately 200,000 kilometers are paved. Great. Denise answers to that with this photograph, which is not very well seen, but you have it here in the exhibition and in the book, in which the gold, a gold, a path of gold, go through the forest, you know, telling us about this incredible uh, attack to the old world of the forest. Another problem is the nuclear plants. This is the one in Agra, which is in Parati, exactly, a few kilometers away from all the photographs and the, and the, and the art that Denise created. This is not the only one. We have this here, I took it from internet, and the red is mine, the red on top is mine. 53 nuclear plants in Brazil. I know they're very big in relation to the geography, but it quite, it's quite something. So Denise goes to that in a very sensitive way, just with the art. But my question is, do you think that we, Denise as an artist, other artists, and we, the ones that think about it and support it, which is the majority of the population, are we able to stop this destruction? I am very negative, or very, uh, yeah, negative, not positive about it. I think we won't be able to do it. There are certain, you know, the idea of the island that we saw before, 
and you see the man, one of the Kaisaras, looking at it from the, from the distance, looking at an island of that kind, and seeing how it is kind of disappearing into the water. All the, these other um, photographs and collages of Denise in which the destruction of the beautiful forest that I showed you before is seen in a very plain way, like this one here. Or that one with a beautiful tree, only one, alone, left alone, probably won't be there any longer. Or that one here. I know that Denise is very positive about the future. She has a positive nature, which I admire, because I am like the philosopher who cries. She's not the philosopher that laughs, but, <laughs> but I am the philosopher that cries. I'm always being like that. I can't help it. Um, but Denise thinks that this can be reversed if we uh, start working on it. If the scientists, if the politicians, if the population, they all work together, the nature in Brazil will be, ab will, will be able to renovate itself in this way. Uh, sorry. In this photograph, which is here also in the exhibition, this mixture that she does, this collage that she does, she thinks that this is going to happen again, that land, earth, nature will become and overcome the destruction that has happened. And she does this, this other very beautiful image in the, uh, in the exhibition, which is a roundel with the center and cut around it all the species that we have seen dead will appear again. When I saw it, I said, oh, Denise has uh, have some inspiration. She had to have inspiration in someone. Every artist on earth doesn't work only by itself. It works in the shoulders of the previous ones. The image of the previous ones are very important. And here we have the table of the mm, capi de capital sins, or I think it's called dead sins in, in English, in the Prado Museum too, where there is in the center the, the vision of Christ, which is the life, for, of course, and then around it, the seven sins. The seven sins, as we know, are very bad ones. The very <laughs> bad ones, <laughs> very bad ones. Yeah, wrath, hmm? which is always related to power, greed, hmm? sloth, pride, hmm? lust, envy. So they're very, very difficult people to fight with. She thinks that it's not going to be like this. She thinks, Denise thinks it's going to be like this other image of Porsche <laughs> in the Garden of Earthly Delights. <laughs> yeah, where in the center of women, in this case, the symbol of life, you know, and around women are men uh, riding different animals, which are the characters and their passions of life, and then after that will come the center of the panel, which is the society, an endless life. Yeah, it's possible. We would like to work in that way for people like this. You know, this is the lady I showed you before with the 24 children around. And in this, we have her in the center, the daughter Ruth behind, which is a beautiful one, and the little grandson in the middle looking into the future, looking to us, say, what are you going to do for us to uh, survive? That's okay. But I would like to finish with Dante, with Dante in the Divine Comedy, and see where we are now. And it's the beginning of the Divine Comedy, which I knew it by heart in Italian, but I don't know by heart in English, so I got it in my phone. When halfway through the journey of our life, I found, I found that I was in a gloomy wood because the path which led a right was lost. And ah, how hard it is to say just what this wild and rough and stubborn woodland was, the very thought of which renews my fear, so bitter it was that death is little way. Yeah. I think that humanity, from the point of view of a historian, the whole of humanity is now probably more or less in the middle of our way through life. 
we cannot reverse, in my opinion, what is going through. We cannot reverse the losses in the Amazon and in the rainy forest, which is the source of the life of humanity. Also, the Amazon and that area around it, in the whole of South America, is in a way um, a brief moment in the history or in the life of Earth. So I don't know how long we could be able to preserve that incredible balance of possibilities that had been there for millions of years, but for how long? For how long will this humanity, which is half crazy, will be able to proceed and not be destructive, suicidal? I don't know, it's the question for the seminar. <laughs> Thank you. We actually didn't plan it that way, but we have the right person to answer that question. <laughs> and that <laughs> is right. <laughs> and that is Tom Lovejoy. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Tom back. Actually, well, he is from here. He is always with us uh, as an advisor, as a participant. As I mentioned, he is a professor in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at at George Mason University, Senior Fellow at the United Nations Foundation for Science, Economics, and Environment. He's based here in Washington, served uh, on the Science and Environmental Councils under uh, Presidents Reagan, Bush, and Clinton, uh, and was also World Bank's Chief Biodiversity Advisor and Lead Specialist for Environment in Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, in the 80s, he brought international attention to the world's tropical rainforest, and in particular to the Brazilian Amazon, where he has worked since 65. Lovejoy was a recipient of the prestigious Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and in 2009, he was the winner of BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award in uh, the ecology and conservation biology category. Uh, he holds a uh, Bachelor of Science and PhD in biology from Yale University. Tom, I don't know if you want to speak from here or from there, but the floor is yours. So just a, a few final sort of reflective remarks to a remarkably rich afternoon. Uh, and thank you, each one of you, uh, for your really amazing contributions, uh, starting with Denise for inspiring the whole session. So what does a scientist have to say about art? Uh, well, maybe if any scientist ever said it uh, well, uh, it was Einstein, who was asked at one point uh, whether, I think it was a Mozart sonata or something like that, could be described mathematically. And he said, yes, it could, but then it wouldn't be art. Uh, so. There is that duality, I think, built into the way the world works almost from the beginning of life on Earth. Uh, one of the mostly forgotten aspects of uh, Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species is when he talks about not just natural selection and survival of the fittest, but artistic selection. How do some of these extraordinarily uh, beautiful patterns and structures come to be in nature? It's because in the process of natural selection, uh, it is actually being chosen for its actual beauty. Uh, so it shouldn't be surprising in the end that there is this uh, 
uh, wonderful pull and uh, positive reinforcement back and forth between art uh, and nature uh, and science. So another really important way to think about this uh, is in terms of the environmental challenge, which is what this seminar series is all about. Uh, and I'm not about to take any time detailing its scale and its urgency. That's obvious to everybody here. Uh, but I would make a really important point, uh, which is the environmental challenge is not only about science. It is also about being human and how we decide uh, individually uh, and as a society uh, how we are going to take that lens of being human uh, and try and figure out uh, a way to have a sustainable future uh, surrounded by all the beauty uh, as well as benefit uh, that nature brings us. So as you can imagine, many times uh, young people come to me and say they want to go into conservation and, you know, what should I study? Uh, I mean, should I major in science? And my answer is always some form of the following. Yes, do learn enough science so that you actually know what you're doing is going to really work. But other than that, follow your heart. And it's, so you could act as a scientist, you could act as sort of a lawyer or you're through, through the lens of commerce, or you could make a huge difference with a poem uh, or a song uh, or a piece of art. Uh, so the, uh, the, the power of art in all of this is, is actually extraordinary. Uh, and I was asked to reflect uh, a few years back uh, on the early years of the World Wildlife Fund and uh, how things were different today from then. And one of the points I made is that, uh, you know, even 30 years ago, uh, most people in this country, and it was similar elsewhere in the world, uh, got their news from three networks and public television. Uh, and they each competed with each other for the same information. Each one, would want, each one wanted to scoop the other. And that meant that the American public basically started with the same basic information. And today, of course, it's splintered into uh, more than a hundred channels. Uh, people basically can go to their point of view and not learn anything. Uh, and uh, I may be as guilty of that as anybody, but uh, so I explained that. And one of the one of the questions was, "Well, you just described this splintered world of media. I mean, what can you do about that?" And I actually had a one-word answer, uh, which was art. <laughs> art can cut across a lot. Uh, so uh, Naomi talked about this new geological era we are in called the Anthropocene because the human impact uh, on the planet is almost of a geological scale. Uh, in one sense, I have, I've never really liked the term Anthropocene because I think for the most of the public, it, it will just confuse. Uh, but I will be really happy to use the term Anthropocene when it comes to mean that we've actually got it together and have started managing ourselves so that we actually have a sustainable future. So in closing, uh, I don't want to get in the way of people's opportunity <coughs> to see the art on the fifth floor and the fourth floor and in the uh, entrance gallery downstairs on the ground floor. Uh, so I just want to tell the following story about Sir Christopher Wren, you know, an amazing architect who 
built so many of, of London's churches, uh, including Westminster Abbey. And he is buried in Westminster Abbey. And he has a very simple epitaph, which in my butchered Latin I will give you, which is, Si monumentum requiris circumspice. If a monument is required, look around you. And that's what we now offer you with Denise's art. Thank you. We have a few minutes for questions if you have some. Go ahead, identify ourselves for the rest of the group. And uh, they want to see the art. Yeah, they want to see the art. So we are going to have a reception following this. So uh, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of uh, Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. Normally, I don't make notes about questions, but this will be quick, and I was so impressed. But I like what Tom was saying as far as the natural selection of beauty because it's uh, order, beauty, and all that that uh, joins and unites all of uh, the world. And coming out of a, uh, in a sense, a Japanese background because of my life and uh, studies there, I wanted to ask this one question for Denise. What, what are the three things that you learn by looking at this creation through the quartz and the combination of nature and the balance of that that really leads us to hope for the future for both the environment, the earth, and humankind? And thank you for being here. <laughs> A very simple question. <laughs> Well, um, I learned that um, if quartz survives and it's so around our earth, that means we can survive. And that the obstacles, because I think right now we are really facing huge obstacles, they are not for us to die. They are just for us to find the way, like quartz, to survive. So we will have to understand this that is happening from another perspective and um, be very creative to our human future, to how we reimagine us in Earth. Yes, please. Uh, there's the microphone. Hi, my name is Lori Timmerman, and I lived in Brazil in the 70s as an exchange student and saw the destruction, you know, and saw the, the fires at, at night through Paraná State and saw the um, conquest to the west and then big charred uh, trees. And so in terms of hope, uh, at another conference here in Washington, National Academies of Science, uh, on ecologies, societies, and economies, the whole theme was land rehabilitation. So at that event, I learned there is a um, major, you know, 100 organizations consortium to start to reforest, and it and they've signed up under the uh, Bun Convention. So I just wondered if um, you've connected with the, that momentum or that that uh, initiative. Reforestation, major uh. effort. So uh, I think reforestation and restoration of, in fact, other ecosystems, uh, grasslands, coastal wetlands, agro-ecosystems, uh, is an essential part of our future uh, if it's to be a really sustainable future. Because there's a huge amount of degraded land in the world uh, we're adding, you know, billions more people. Uh, they will, you know, deserve a reasonable quality of life and good food supply. Uh, and so I think the restoration motive has got to be hand in glove with the normal conservation motive. Uh, I think it can help us on climate change. 
Uh, and in the case of the Amazon, I think what it can do is build back a margin of safety uh, to maintain the hydrological cycle. So is the bond challenge all three major environmental conventions now include restoration uh, and it's just gathering steam. Yeah, and, and there is one information I think important for instance to have in mind. Uh, you know, cattle ranching, for instance, we know is was a main driver of deforestation in the Amazon. Now, uh, there are uh, new ways of doing uh, cattle ranching. Actually, this is being, uh, you know, commented in Brazil because what we have to do in Brazil, Brazil is going to continue to to produce and export and eat uh, lots of meat, but uh, you can you can do it more rationally. You can use less space to do that. Uh, we've, we've probably heard this. In Brazil, we have more cows than people, and we have each cow has about a hectare of land uh, on average. But you have to concentrate the animals. You have to do uh, some new methods of uh, raising them. And you can do this. Actually, there are just recently uh, read an article by a very uh, uh, interesting agronomist saying that depending on how you develop the pastures, the pastures can become uh, carbon sinks for you know a greater part of the year. So I it's not uh, you know uh, it's not all bad. It, it depends on the creativity of people. And science is very important here. And to think differently, and uh, so uh, I just wanted to give you this this notion because I thought for many years that there was no way of doing cattle ranching in Brazil in a more you know rational way. Well, apparently you can do it. Uh, it takes investment, it takes knowledge, and it takes determination because you have to enforce those policies. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, with courage, there are lots of interest there that doesn't want to do things in a different way. One more question, if there is one. If not, okay, let's wrap this up. We are at the exact time to end. I would like to uh, thank very much uh, Denise for bringing this beautiful work to us. Obviously, Manuela, Naomi for having brought the idea uh, and uh, and Thomas always uh, for being our our guru on all things related to sustainability. Uh, we have now a small reception on the fifth floor landing. The fourth floor changed. Fourth floor, bigger space downstairs. And please join us. And I would like to ask you for a round of applause for our speaker.